Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the Waterways presentation, where our keynote speaker and panelist will be sharing tribal and indigenous perspectives about water resources. My name is Jennifer Alford, and I am an associate professor at CSUSB in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, also serving as a faculty associate with the Office of Community Engagement and as the director of the CSUSB Water Resources Institute. This event is funded through the CSUSB Intellectual Life Grant with sponsorship support from the CSUSB Office of Community Engagement, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, CSU Water Resources and Policy Initiative, and the CSUSB Water Resources Institute. I am pleased to share that the Office of Community Engagement has sponsored 10 copies of our keynote speaker's latest book. Event attendees who RSVP'd and are on today's Zoom call have been automatically entered into a drawing and winners will be notified through email. I would also like to note that this event is being recorded and this recording will be available through the CSUSB Office of Community Engagement website in the coming days. Additionally, attendees may participate in questions and answer sessions by using the chat feature. Office of Community Engagement staff will be assisting me in monitoring the chat and we will try to get to everyone's questions. I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dina Julia Whitaker, author of many wonderful writings and activist work, including the book, As Long As Grass Grows, serving as an adjunct professor of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos, and as the poly direct, policy director and senior research associate at the Center for World Indigenous Studies. Additionally, I would like to welcome our panelists, Kimberly Miller, environmental specialist with the Mar excuse me, Morongo Band of Mission Indians Environmental Protection Department, and Krishna Savas, environmental manager of the Soboba Band of Lucinos Indians, who I'm proud to say are both graduates of the CSUSB Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. I would also like to recognize those in attendance and who have supported today's event. Director of the CSU Center for Community Engagement, Jody Botello. Members of the CSUSB Tribal Advisory Council, Dr. James Finnellan, Director of the CSUSB Center for Indigenous People Studies, Robert Levi Jr., CSUSB's first elder cultural bearer in residence, Diane Podoski, Director of the Office of Community Engagement, and Juan Ochoa, Office of Community Engagement, Administrative Coordinator for Faculty Initiatives. We would also like to recognize Thin Lee, Information Technology Consultant with the CSUSB Technology Support Center, who has provided essential guidance for this program and our students, colleagues, and community members present today. Thank you. Before we begin with our keynote speaker, I would like to share the CSUSB Land Recognition Statement. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral lands of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian Indigenous peoples. Thank you again for your interest and participation. And now I would like to turn our attention to our keynote speaker, Dina Julia Whitaker. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Why peace nux silk? Isquis Dina Julia Whitaker, Isma Kalak Squis Nux Bus. And um, I just greeted you <clears throat> in our language. The, the language is known as Insok Chin. Um, I'm a Sinaiqs descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes of Washington State. And um, in I just greeted you as relatives the way that we we would do in a cultural setting. And I'm uh, pleased to be speaking to you from the traditional and unceded homelands of the Ahashaman 
Nation and One Enyo Band of Mission Indians here in what's currently called San Clemente, uh, Orange County, Southern California. So, um, so thank you again for this invitation to come in and present my work to you. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen right now. I do have a PowerPoint for you. Let's see. <clears throat> And let's see here. Okay, very good. So I want to, uh, this has been a really uh, interesting invitation and way to think through some of these ideas about water and our relationships to water um, here locally in Southern California. And so I'm thinking of, about it in terms of like, how do we, you know, if we, as we look at the history of, of human relationships to water in various, um, in various frameworks and throughout historical um, time, how do we go from being in relationship in a relationship with water that is fundamentally dysfunctional? I would call it a dysfunctional relationship to uh, to being in a, a, to transforming that relationship to. Uh, a relationship that's that's more sustainable and certainly based on a different kind of worldview that um, that respects the life of water and the life of humans and other um, living beings that in a way that water supports. So so really all of life and um, watershed ecosystems. So let's, uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about my work here um, on, I'm just trying to spread my PowerPoint here. So, so I think about, when I'm thinking about these relationships, I'm thinking uh, through the lens of environmental justice. This is, this is what I come to, how I come to this conversation as someone whose research focus is in, uh, you know, particularly in environmental justice. And it goes back, um, for years, really, and it really goes back to my my undergraduate years when I and before that, even before I went back to school as an older non traditional student uh, and somebody who considers myself uh, or at the time considered myself an environmentalist, but also as a native person. Um, an urban Indian person growing up in an urban environment, not within my tribal culture on the reservation. Uh, but it, so I bring like that positionality and my concern and care for the environment and environmental issues um, because I, well, I grew up in a household as a, as a Colville person. Um, I grew up during a time when our, it was a time called termination, it was a federal policy where the US was, you know, trying to solve you know, find the final solution to the Indian problem, as they put it. And so termination in, in that era during the 1950s and 1960s was a way that they were imagining the solution to this ongoing problem um, in which Indians are always obstacles to obtaining land. And, uh, and it was particularly during that time period, it was particularly uh, uh, important for Colville people because our tribe was, was debating whether or not we should accept an offer from the federal government to basically buy our reservation in this termination uh, framework. And, and in, the, in studies about termination, the Colville termination battle is kind of held up as an example of a success of how we, uh, we actually, after a 20 year debate, chose not to uh, terminate our relationship, but it was really a close, a close battle and termination almost won out. But I grew up with those conversations around the dinner table about how should my mother vote? Cause they put it to a vote of the membership. Do we vote for termination uh, and take the money and, you know, and hope for the best or do we follow the advice of the elders who said you should never sell your land? And so 
that stuck with me my whole life. And, you know, this, this idea that you should not sell your land. And, uh, and I carry that with me today as someone who owns uh, fractionated interests uh, of, of allotments, even though they're fractionated interests that I can't even use because of the way that the laws are set up. But um, so I hold on to that, even though I can't use it because, uh, because I've been so um, influenced by this idea that you don't sell your land. So I think all of that like really influences um, who I who I am and what I bring as uh, as a research um, interest uh, to this. So it was kind of natural that I would gravitate toward this conversation we call environmental justice. And so um, the 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 studies for me began as an undergrad, as I mentioned, um, taking environmental justice courses both in Native American studies and uh, and later in grad school in American studies, and where I where I noticed that there was very little material that was that I was being uh, given to read and taught about that was written from an indigenous perspective in a way that really articulated uh, what environmental justice is for Native people. And, and so it was this hole in the literature that I found that I saw and I'm like, well, it's, you know, I, it really piqued my interest. So, uh, so I just kept focusing it on, on it all through grad school of, of, and all the research papers that I wrote were, were around environmental justice issues and examining it from different angles. And, um, and so what I, what I came to realize was that in the way that environmental justice and injustice is framed in the conventional narratives needed to be indigenized because uh, those narratives did not, they did not take into consideration the very different realities of Native uh, and American Indian people. And, um, and it's really because of this this idea called environmental racism. Uh, th this is how the literature unfolded throughout the 1980s through studies coming out of black communities in the South. And, um, and they postulated that, they, that these communities were being targeted because of their, because their communities of color disempowered and that this was a very particular type of racism. And so, they basically tested that hypothesis and it came, you know, it came to be seen that yes, environmental racism is, is a thing. And, and so it needed to be theorized in that way to understand how, you know, communities of color are um, disproportionately targeted for toxic waste uh, facilities, other kinds of toxic industry that, that expose them to, um, you know, harm and risk uh, through the through the toxification of environments. And so, um, it, I mean, it was a good framework for those kinds of communities, but for Native people, it's not a broad enough analysis uh, because it doesn't take into consideration the historical reality of invasion, genocide, and land dispossession. And so, so my, my, my hypothesis or my theory is that environmental justice theory, activism, law and policy uh, needs to be indigenized. And we do this by recognizing those um, very particular histories, but also <clears throat> American Indians, very different political relationship to the US as American Indians, not uh, or as, as nations, not as ethnic minorities. Um, so this is a very different conversation for native people. And, um, and so this is, <clears throat> this is really um, the, the core of uh, this particular book and this research project. So it, the beginning place is to talk about settler colonialism and what we, you know, what, how we talk about and the frameworks that, that um, shape our material realities and our relationship to the state. And um, I always like to use this photo because it's it's so probably all of us have seen it at some point in our lives or another. And it's really the embodiment of it's a physical representation of manifest destiny. We all know what that is. Um, and so so we can recognize 
all of its constituent aspects uh, in this in this image by uh, recognizing you know the the very the central figure here which of course is a very fair skinned uh, anglo obviously uh, white woman who has these angelic sort of uh, qualities about her her and she's got this book book in her arm that you're tempted to think is a uh, a Bible, but it's really not a Bible. It's a, it says education on there, or uh, yeah, I think it says school or education. It's it's about um, the educational process, and and so there there are these religious undertones to the image, but there are also the uh, the trappings of of technology. Uh, as we see on her arm, she's got a roll of wire, and it's attached to what we presume would be a, a telegraph wire. We also see in toward, toward the right, toward the east, you know, um, the built environment. We see the technology of bridge building and shipbuilding, and uh, we see the railroads, and we see covered wagons and stagecoaches. And in the foreground, we see uh, you know, the intrepid pioneers coming uh, with their European farming implements and, and miners in the foreground with their, you know, these are obviously probably gold prospectors. And, and you know, she's as this figure of Columbia is her name, she travels westward, she's bringing her light, you know, we can interpret that as European enlightenment. Uh, and as she moves across uh, the landscape toward the west, she's chasing out the darkness and the darkness is represented uh, by you know the the na the native people people who are running away you know presumably uh and and the buffalo and the wild animals and and nature uh and so the the message of all of this and this is in fact how it gets uh embedded into our state narratives is about indigenous inferiority. It's about how native people are uh, constructed as inferior, um, which enables the invading populations to legitimize the taking of land. All of this gets embedded into the legal structure, um, beginning with the very first, uh, well, beginning with, I would say, the Declaration of Independence and the 27th um, grievance in which uh, you know, the Thomas Jefferson is complaining about the merciless Indian savages. And, you know, this is one reason why, uh, you know, the revolution needs to happen because the king has incited this. And um, but then, you know, with the, the first Supreme Court decision in 1823, um, where the doctrine of discovery gets first articulated, uh, which is all about using, uh, you know, drawing on the history of uh, Christianity uh, and the superior genius of Europe, as Justice Marshall um, said in that decision to to justify this uh, the the imposition of European titles onto the land, which only gives indigenous people usufruct rights or the only rights of occupancy, not the rights of title, uh, and so so this all of this. And more. This is just the beginning of this. The establishment of um, of this very paternalistic and hegemonic relationship between the U.S. and Native nations. And so, um, if we follow the logic of uh, settler colonialism, as Patrick Wolf wrote about it, he talks about settler colonialism being um, structurally genocidal um, for for Indigenous peoples in the Americas because it's all about um, the taking of land. Um, it's not about race. It's not about religion. Although, although those things come in to uh, be part of it, to justify the ongoing and structural nature of it, ultimately, um, it's about the acquisition of land and how um, how this is the the the, re, the raison d'etre for uh, for settler invading populations to to come here and uh, create this structure. It's always about the acquisition to indigenous lands. So, <clears throat> to to give some examples about how uh, this how this superiority inferiority relationship. Uh, embeds itself in the landscape. We talk about, you know, settler colonialism and manifest destiny being 
um, about modernity and about uh, again the superior genius of Europe as 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 uh, Marshall imagined it, um, and and westward expansion and the industrial revolution. This is all about uh, remaking the landscape in very Eurocentric ways. And uh, <clears throat> these progress, these narratives about progress and modernity, and this term ecocide, which was which was uh, first written about relative to native people by by Johansson and um, Grindy, uh, in a book by the same name, ecocide, uh, ecocide of Native America, and and um, so this term ecocide brings together the terms ecosystem and genocide. And, and it's particularly relevant for native people because of the way that this westward expansion and the, the industrial revolution and the technological revolution, um, while it's bringing progress um, to settler populations as it sweeps westward, uh, is it brings death to indigenous people uh, because of these ecocidal processes, the remaking of the landscape in these uh, Euroc Eurocentric ways um, are uh, ecocidal for native people. And there are three really um, pr pr prominent examples that I like to point to, to, to demonstrate that. Uh, the first, example in this image on the left is the, the Missouri River water, watershed, um, which spans the Dakotas and Nebraska. And, um, and we look to the history, and this all happens in the 20th century. So this is not, this is like uh, post, uh, post industrial revolution. So it's indicative of, a, of how these processes continue. Uh, and uh, you know, beyond beyond that period of time, um, in the 1940s, 1944, the U.S. passes the Pick Sloan Act, which is all about um, building uh, con flood control um, through the building of dams in the Missouri River watershed. And so, this law creates five dams, just five dams. And, and what it does is because dams, of course, they, uh, you know, it, they are built for numerous reasons for water storage, for flood control. Um, and the, of course, the water storage is for uh, irrigation, um, for farming. Well, um, so as these dams create these lakes, what it, the impact that it has on the land in this region is um, the, the massive flooding out of um, the people, you know, cur that were called the Great Sioux Nation. So uh, the seven reservations, which is the remnants of um, the original Great Sioux Nation uh, reservation that was created in 1850, uh, 1851. And so the, the building of these dams, um, as the work of Nick Estes shows in his uh, amazing book, uh, Our History is Our Future, um, he talks about how the flooding of these lands displaces um, over 900 Lakota families. Um, so we're talking about, you know, literally thousands of people who get flooded out of their homelands to accommodate settler populations. And so, um, so this massive human displacement results in the loss of um, lands, the loss of uh, resources like timber and medicine and food and um, towns and homes and, uh, you know, sacred sites, burials, everything, you know, that are core aspects of native life are lost as a result. And this is, you know, within the lifetime of people who are living today. So, and of course, this is, uh, you know, Lake Oahe was the, the, the lake that was at the center of the Standing Rock, no Dakota Access Pipeline um, controversy, uh, where, you know, now they have this, you know, paradoxical relationship to this lake. Now that even though all this water has flooded them out and caused all this uh, misery for the people, it's now the water source for uh, not just the reservation communities, but also 17 million people down, down river. Um, so it's, it's this very, you know, 
paradoxical and, uh, relationship that they now have, but it's water and it needs to be protected. And so Maniwi Choni becomes to be that, um, the moniker, the motto for that movement. Um, in this image in the middle here is something diff similar, but really different that's happening. Um, this is something that I grew up with because the Calvo Reservation is right up in here, if you can see my cursor, right up here in this area. And, uh, and this is the upper Columbia Plateau. And then down here, we have the lower Columbia Pl River Plateau. Um, so on the upper Columbia River Plateau, we had the building of the Grand Coulee Dam, which um, was completed in about 1940. And the center for the, the cultures of the upper Columbia River Plateau peoples was a place called Swanetku or the uh, Kettle, Kettle Falls. And it's a major, major salmon fishery. And it was the heart of our cultures for thousands of years. And something similar happens down here on the Southern Columbia Plateau with, um, with the, the people down there and the, a place called Celilo Falls, which was another major salmon fishery. Um, and both get flooded with the building of massive dams. Um, but what also happens is not only are those dams built, but there's um, over 60 dams built in the entire watershed, which uh, altogether have um, not only does it rip sort of rip the cult heart of our cultures away because no longer do we have access to salmon in our part of the river, but it leads to the collapse of salmon populations. And this is something that's playing out now and it's been playing out for decades. Uh, and now is, you know, it's reaching you know, critical levels. So it's, a, it's an environmental disaster of a different kind. And, uh, and um, so we talk about this as, you know, now we have to think about how do we uh, restore that because salmon is a keystone species. And when you have the disappearance of a keystone species, it leads to, the, to it's a cascade effect that leads to the collapse of other kinds of species. So it's very much of an environmental uh, problem in addition to being a, a culturally genocidal problem. Um, on on uh, the right is something different. It's not so much related to water, but uranium mining, although we could talk about that. But on the Colorado Plateau, um, we're seeing um, you know, thousands of, of uh, expended uranium mines that have been abandoned. Uh, toxic waste, you know, radioactive toxic waste uh, is continuing to contaminate the lands, waters, and airs of the people, especially in the Four Corners region down here. Uh, you know, around um, the Navajo Nation and the Pueblos down there. So, um, so these are these all three of these combined are you know just examples of um, the devastating environmental impacts of settler colonialism as ecocidal processes for native peoples. Um, I also wrote in the book about the history of the environmental movement. I won't spend too much time on this, but. Um, the history of the environmental movement was some, and in its relationship to Indian country was something that really hadn't been um, written about uh, much at all. But it involved, it's about how um, the conservation and preservation movements, which began, you know, in the, uh, the mid to late 19th century with um, the creation of the national park system, uh, and some of the early theorists like Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson before him and then John Muir, um, how the logics of white and settler supremacy become embedded in these movements uh, that are based on virgin wilderness narratives, you know, unpeopled landscapes um, that, that again also are narratives of um, legitimizing uh, indigenous dispossession. Um, and all of that gets, gets brought forth into the conservation and preservation movements or what's sometimes called proto-environmentalism. And and it carries forth into the 20th century with second wave environmentalism and, uh, and the counterculture and the back to the land movement, um, which we see uh, you know, represented here, oops, represented by, um, oops, 
there we go, by the Crying Indian commercial of um, the Keep America Beautiful campaign, which was something I remember really well because I was um, a teenager when that commercial came out. Um, but you know this how how that second wave environmental movement um, becomes infused with cultural appropriation and Indian fetishism, which are really uh, ongoing uh, forms of erasure for native people and the the assumption of Indian aesthetics and you know the hippies uh, emulating Indians in in everything that they're doing. Um, it's it's even though it was done with a, you know some modicum of respect it, it still brings forth all these values of settler entitlement to land um, that they bring with them into it you know unselfconsciously and so so what it, all of this does is is this is colonization which is imposing these foreign values on the land in place of thousands of years old management practices which are created through indigenous knowledges. Um, so indigenous knowledge systems are, you know, we speak about them in terms of um, multiple knowledges because there is not one universal or absolutist indigenous knowledge because all indigenous, indigenous knowledges are place-based. Um, they are, they emerge out of relationships to very particular ecosystems and environments. Um, and so, um, these are based on cultural epistemologies, you know, systems of knowing, ways of knowing the world, and worldviews that um, that uh, shape the way Indigenous peoples relate to their worlds and and how they use landscapes in particular ways, manage landscapes in particular ways. Um, and traditional ecological knowledge is one type of Indigenous knowledge. Um, and so we talk about indigenous knowledge being not just um, theoretical, it's not just something that native, like warm, fuzzy, you know, spirituality uh, kinds of conversations, but it's, it's applied knowledge. It's how people um, in, intervened in their landscapes to, for various reasons, to, um, to maximize food production, to maximize um, it, um, environments for wildlife and for the growth of cultural materials and, you know, all kinds of things like that. So how Native people are, you know, have used knowledge in ways that were, um, were physical and had material benefits for them and, and their relations, their natural relations in the world. So to bring it specific, kind of bring it down to uh, the, the specifics of water use, genocide and, uh, and ecocide in California, I think most of us are probably aware of these histories um, about water use and policy paralleling um, the, states, the state's particularly genocidal history um, where um, indigenous dispossession becomes the possibility for a ma massive uh, water and diversion projects and dams. Um, of course, it, it's done through numerous, uh, numerous uh, mechanisms, uh, one of them being the 18 so-called secret unratified treaties that the state or that the, the federal government made with um, tribes right after statehood. Uh, and those treaties, uh, you know, these treaties get created by the federal government, the state refuses to ratify them, but they take the land anyway. Um, and these, uh, the legacy of this is continues to impinge on non-federally recognized tribes, especially, um, and their ability to protect their homelands and resources. Um, the Central Valley Project uh, is, uh, is, a, is an example that's been written about and also the State Water Project. So the Central Valley Project is a federal was a federal program designed in 1933, and then um, the state water bond created the state water project in 1960. Um, and <clears throat> these are uh, you know about how headwater studies and the violations. This is taken from research by Middleton, Golly, and Hoke in 2018, and they look at how um, their study of headwaters uh, were contained and based on violations to tribes. Um, and uh, a prime example of that was the Shasta Dam and how the building of that dam um, 
you know, led to um, the collapse or the, you know, salmon po problems with salmon, salmon populations uh, and a special threats to uh, the Winnemumwintu lands and, uh, and their relationship to salmon. Uh, also in the Pitt River Medicine Highland, uh, Medicine Lake Highlands uh, geothermal development um, project is another way, uh, another uh, kind of impact um, in the mountain Maidu with um, in the Federal River water, uh, the Feather River watershed. Um, these are all uh, direct impacts of these particular projects. Um, and of course, the Owens Valley project uh, or the Owens Valley and uh, Owens Valley over Owens River and the LA Department of Water and Power, uh, which I think is, we're probably all pretty familiar with this. Um, this, this is the land of um, the Paiute people um, and the name that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, um, but that translates to the land of flowing water. Of course, uh, as the image below uh, shows us that the, the, the just devastating environmental impacts because of the depletion of the water in that region um, has led to this, uh, you know, just horrible um, environmental ongoing problem um, for the for all the people there, not just the the Paiute, but everybody there has been impacted because of this um, dried up lake uh, and and river system. Um, the creation of the reservation for the Paiute people, uh, reservations for the Paiute people um, in 1912 set aside um, lands for them, but was later withdrawn um, by the LA DW, for the LADWP exploitation of the river. So there's a, um, a you know, uh, certainly major um, violations to the tribes there. Um, and then as the years go on and the lake and the river is dried up, um, it's become this environmental, you know, disaster zone, which is um, is said to be the largest source of source of dust pollution in the country. So the the particulate matter um, that is airborne impacts people, in, especially with respiratory um, problems. And I want to I want to talk about um, a particular study by somebody named Charlie Sepulveda. Charles Charles Sepulveda is a a Hashiman and Tongva um, person. And he did this uh, wonderful study uh, that was published in, uh, in uh, I'm gonna give you references at the end of this PowerPoint. There's um, some suggest, there's a bibliography with suggested readings. Uh, and he, so he writes in this study uh, about the Santa Ana River watershed. And of course the Santa Ana River watershed brings it local um, to, uh, the, the topic at hand for this uh, this this talk today. Um, and so the the in the Santa Ana River watershed, which is um, the traditional territory of numerous tribes um, and bands, um, including the Saboba, uh, Saboba people, San, Juan, San Manuel, uh, Morongo, and the Santa Rosa Band of Cahuilla, as the federal federally recognized tribes. Um, but the Hashiman and Tongva, of course, are non-federally recognized tribes. And so, um, so there are particular ways that they have been, um, you know, left out of conversations around um, watershed management. So um, it's said to be the Santa Ana River is said to be the largest riparian ecosystem in Southern California. Uh, and in his study, uh, he talks about um, the system of heter heteropatriarchy, looking at the big arc of history, beginning with the Spanish, about how heteropatriarchal uh, systems were imposed on indigenous peoples, beginning with the Spanish, of course, with, with uh, Catholicism, the imposition of Christianity, uh, <clears throat> and later, uh, carry, you know, later was carried out with the spent with the the Mexican and then especially the American um, period and uh, and how this the the imposition of hetero patriarchy on the people was mirrored in <clears throat> the settler relationships to the river um, and and he says that the lands and the waters became um, non-consensually colonized in the same pe same way that the people were. It was this uh, process of forced domestication. Uh, and so 
<clears throat> he says, like Indian people, the river was, was viewed as a menace. It was dangerous. It was something that needed to be controlled. Uh, and so they did this, of course, by you know, channelizing, building all these uh, structures that impeded and controlled and, uh, and basically imprisoned the river in the same way that the, the people were imprisoned. And, um, and he talks about, you know, example of how the Ahashiman and Tongva are excluded um, in processes of um, watershed management uh, that, uh, that happened in a study in 2013. It was a Bureau of, of um, Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation study that looked at um, the how the, the name of the study is a long uh, name, something about the uh, disadvantaged communities and Native American tribes. I'm talking about how, um, you know, it just focused on the federally recognized tribes and, and completely excluded the Ahashiman and Tongva people um, from that study. So, uh, so this is a way that, um, you know, these current federal frameworks that favor federally recognized tribes um, exclude and, uh, you know, continue a process of dispossession for, for the Hashman and Tongva communities. And he finally, he talks about um, a framework, sort of an alternative framework of a way of imagining a different kind of relationship between the settler population and the river. And he draws on the on Ahashiman and Tongva language, this term, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, kuyam, um, which means guess. And he talks about it as a way for, um, for to think about settler relationships to the landscape and to indigenous peoples by, by um, you know, kind of rejecting the, the domination framework, the, the dominance and the, uh, the, the centrality of um, taking over land um, to being to seeing themselves as guests and, and how we relate to the, to the natural environment in ways that are more respectful through, under, through kind of rejecting the, an ownership uh, kind of um, uh, way of looking at it. Um, this is just some some highlights from that study, the Bureau of Reclamation study, and how they um, they some of the, just some of the problems that said uh, that's that are problems about um, you know potential water management issues uh, in tribal lands or these tribal homelands. Um, I don't need to go through all of these. This is just a, an example of um, how. Uh, uh, some of the problems of, um, you know, the complications of um, watershed management in this area. And just to, to give you some idea of how water, uh, you know, some, some sort of uh, main points about water quality and tribal governance uh, and how uh, tribes are empowered uh, within the federal system. Um, in relative to federally recognized tribes in law, they have the ability to set their own standards for water quality under the Clean Water Act. So uh, the tri tribes are basically uh, treated as states um, in this framework. Um, an example of that is the Karuk tribe who recently gained um, uh, EPA uh, treatment as a state status. Um, this was re recent, so um, the the Karuk tribes are seen in this federal framework as uh, equal to states regarding um, water quality standards and the ability to set their own standards. Uh, also, Cal EPA uh, uh, has the California Water Resource Control Board, which um, which is a framework for for determining water quality and managing water quality. AB 52 and section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act um, are also frameworks that are used. Um, and in these frameworks, this is, they talk about, um, they, they use the mechanisms of consultation um, uh, where consultation, uh, you know, there's supposed to be processes of consultation um, with tribes um, regarding um, the use of water. Um, but, but I like to talk about it as I talk about my research more broadly, it's about 
you know, consent versus consultation. Um, you know, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which the U.S. signed on to, um, in theory, uh, you know, signed on to this idea of free prior and in, in informed consent. Um, to matters involving tribal uh, territories. Um, but of course it never adheres to it. And so um, this is becoming a growing conversation. I think native people are starting to insist on uh, and demand that, uh, that consent, that uh, these consultative processes go beyond consultation to actually um, obtain consent. This is this is actual um, agency and power for Native people. Um, I walked into a conversation recently with um, the California Coastal Commission. So the California Coastal Commission was was having a, a, a meeting with some local tribal folks around the Poseidon desalination plant um, that's being proposed in Huntington Beach. And one of the things that the, one of the points that was being made was that this process of consultation, which is mandated in state processes, including the, the, the um, Coastal Commission's own tribal consultation process, is that it was never done. There was never any reaching out to local tribal communities for a consultation on this um, desalination plant. Um, another area where uh, consultation, uh, where water management and, and um, quality issues play out, this is something a little tangential, um, but it's related. It's some of the work that I've been involved with around marine protected areas, um, in on obviously in coastal areas. Um, there are 127 of these MPAs. Um, but only one of them actually has any tribal governance uh, process incorporated into them. And so this is something that I think is uh, also a growing conversation. And, uh, and I wanted to point out that, um, that, that the, the concept of tribal sovereignty um, in the for the state purposes says that tribal sovereignty for the purposes of this policy refers to the unique political status of federally recognized tribes. A federally recognized tribe exercises certain jurisdiction uh, and governmental powers over activities and tribal members within its territory. Some of these powers are inherent. Some have been delegated by the United States. Delegated, that's a really important word right there. Um, and all are subject to limitations imposed by the United States. Existing limitations are defined through acts of Congress, treaties, and federal court decisions. So, um, so this is a, a really transparent uh, definition that points out the, the, the paternalistic and hegemonic nature of the relationship of the federal government and tribes. So finally, I wanted to uh, point out how, um, you know, if we think in terms of decolonizing these processes and these relationships, um, it means that we go from um, a process of, uh, you know, in these frameworks of, of indigenous people being seen as inferior to, to reversing it to, to understanding indigenous knowledge as being key and central to how we imagine um, relationships, sustainable relationships to the land and, um, and resources and watersheds um, in this area. This, this painting was created very recently. It was uh, commissioned by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation um, by the artist Charles Hilliard. And now I always incorporate it um, into my presentations because um, because it just it says everything. It's the it's the reverse of um, history to where we need to be in the future. And um, here are the suggested resources. I'm happy to make this available. Um, so um, the, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share now. If I can get my cursor there, there we go. And Wonderful. Thank you so much. We, we greatly appreciate um, you sharing your, your expertise and experiences. Um, I would like to take the, the next 10 minutes to open this up for uh, Q&A <laughs> for any questions that you might have. And then we will start at one o'clock with our panelists. Um, they will each present and then we will 
um, bring uh, Dina back again at that time, um, along with their panelists to answer any other questions that you have. So if we don't get to your question this time in the next block, uh, we will definitely um, do that. So um, I'll be fielding any questions that are coming through. So if you have any questions, please uh, type them um, into uh, the chat, or you'll also see a Q&A uh, box there as well. And uh, why some people are, are adding um, into this, I, I'm curious as a um, faculty member, um, Dina, it's something we, we have in common, <laughs> um, is really when, when, when you're thinking about, um, you know, bringing in this nexus between, um, you know, federal policies and, and, and trying to apply that to the landscape, um, what do you find that's a, a really challenging thing for or concepts for students to understand? And what are maybe some, some ways that you help to bridge these different um, approaches to thinking about our landscape? Well, it's really super complicated, right? I mean, that's the first thing to 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 grasp that that it will it takes uh, it takes a lot of background knowledge to really grasp what the actual landscape is, you know, so to speak, um, around um, the the regulations and interactions between tribes and various governments. Um, the difference between federally recognized, non-federally recognized. So, um, so I mean, it, it can take, I think it takes years really to sort it all out. Um, and, and it's something that, that you just have to continue to study. I can't, I can't even like sum it up, like in a few simple words. It's just, it's really, really complicated. And uh, even for people, practitioners on the ground, people in federal and state, um, you know, offices and agencies don't all know, um, because if they don't have the background to understand the actual histories and the, the legal frameworks that shape these relationships, um, they're not going to have a complete picture. I think, I think it's probably fair to say that, that tribal people probably know better than anybody else because they know their histories they know um, the the mechanisms that have led to their um, to the, the the colonial processes that um, have resulted in these you know very very um, uh, paternalistic relationships so um, so I mean that's my my impression is that native people really know the best all of these histories and and they know what kinds of remedies that they need as well. Thank you. And we have um, questions coming in. <laughs> um, Karen asks, do you have suggestions of how to teach the Declaration of Independence to high school students to recognize the negative effects on Native Americans? How to teach the Declaration of Independence? Yeah, or um, topic, I'm, I'm assuming topics surrounding the, those types of... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really a good place to start uh, to, to, to change the narratives because the goal here is to shift the narratives, to go from um, narratives of Native people as bloodthirsty savages because that's the, you know, pretty much language that's used in the Declaration of Independence um, and to to really examine what was happening on the ground during, during that time of the beginning of the revolution. Why does Thomas Jefferson write that specifically? What's going on? What's going on with the Stamp Act? What's going on with um, what's happening in the Appalachians and settler encroachment and the, the British proclamation of 1763? All of these things are part of it. Uh, the British government was uh, you know, while it was in control of the, the colonies, was uh, tr trying to, uh, on some level, to, to stem the flow of illegal settlement onto indigenous lands. And so that's all a big part of why the revolution happens, but it's rarely ever talked about, and certainly not in our K through 12 education, how that factors in. Um, to, to the revolution and then the creation of the, the, the constitution. Um, that's a whole other conversation, but it's the, the vilifying of indigenous people that is um, an integral part 
of justifying this revolutionary war um, that leads to independence. So, um, so you have to, I think that you, when you're talking about American history, Indian people are always core elements to it. And so, so educators need to um, educate themselves about what about those histories so that they can put it all in proper and complete context. Thank you very much. And we have two questions that are very similar. So I'm gonna try and kind of combine them because they're related. One comes from our panelist, Christian, <laughs> um, and he is curious, uh, what would be some ideal or, or ways for tribes to partner with organizations such as the Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority, which um, uh, you may be familiar with, but for others, it's, it's basically an um, umbrella uh, of, of multiple uh, water agencies um, in our region. Um, and so they work on um, different scales of projects. Um, and then there's a, and then he further wants to know um, what, you know, what are some projects and programs um, that, can, that can benefit uh, tribal nations by partnering um, with such agencies? And a very similar question comes from um, Susie Earp, I wrote the Water Resource Institute. Um, just asking um, if you have any examples of where water agencies have successfully uh, worked with tribal communities and, and, and elevated um, these types of um, uh, views, right, within their work and, and the way that they approach the landscape. Yeah, I mean, those are great questions. And, you know, I, I can't, I don't know that I have a really particular answer. And I'm thinking maybe some of the, somebody in the audience might, um, because I'm not involved in in those processes, I don't know the specifics of how water is managed in the Santa Ana a watershed. Um, but you know, I would say that it's, you know, like in anything, um, tribes have to just, you know, understand who are the players and insert themselves in those processes because they're not going to be asked in general. Um, Native people have always been in the position of having to um, put themselves. Um, in those conversations and advance their own agendas. Um, and, and I think it's just, it's always, you know, it's always been that way. And, um, and that's just, just the way it's, it's got to be. So, you know, I know that's probably like a really unsatisfying answer, but, um, uh, but it, yeah, that's all I have for you on that. <laughs> that that's, yeah, that's a, that's a big, uh, <laughs> that's a big one I, I know. Um, and um, there's a question um, in here uh, about, um, and I'm not seeing where it is in the chat, but uh, in regards to um, non-federally recognized tribes um, and, and how they can be recognized or be brought into um, you know, processes and decisions. Well, yeah, I mean, again, same thing. They, they need to, and they are, they do. Um, do this. They, it, you know, find those spaces and get get physically present in them. Um, this is what a so this is what sovereignty means. It's about how you assert sovereignty. You don't wait for opportunities to to for to be asked to express your sovereignty. But uh, for Native people, it's always about assuming um, that you know, whatever agency is available to them and, and you know, recognizing that um, the limitations of the federal, federal and governing systems and state governing systems. Um, so um, it's just, you know, understanding and doing the research to find out where, you know, who are the players and, and just putting, and I, I can tell you that from my own experience in doing research and, um, you know, working with various kinds of agencies um, and organizations is is that you do the research, you find out who the people are, and you um, and you you network, and you do you make contacts, and you have conversations. Um, I think that there is, you know, there's always a risk of being um, shunned or being ignored, but uh, but. I think there's a growing openness. I mean, there's certainly been um, a, a trend in the state, in, in federal frameworks and also state frameworks is a growing openness. And I'm not saying that it's all good now and everything, but, um, but things are 
things are definitely changing um, in in these governing systems, and um, and the goal is to to uh, to insert your voice and to um, to 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 just you know put it out there and make yourself known. So. Wonderful. And, and one last uh, question for you um, before we trans, um, transition over to our panelists. And again, everyone um, at the end of our panelist um, presentations, we'll be bringing uh, Dina back along with our panelists to answer uh, additional questions. Um, but I wanted to note, uh, Janine here said, I work in an academic library that has a massive amount of archival documentation about settler water use and land displacement of native peoples through Cal throughout California. Are there any suggestions you might have for making this documentation more accessible and useful to current native water activists? Mm. <laughs> Sounds like a treasure. <laughs> yeah. Um, where is that archive? Um, Janine, if, if you could, um, I, I'll chat with her and, and maybe we can um, circle back to this um, as, as a starting point after the panelists, if that's okay. Um, and, and I'll get that information for you. Thank you so much um, for, for your presentation. And we'll talk again with you in just a few moments. Um, I wanted to shift our attention to uh, Kimberly, who will be um, presenting on behalf of, of Morongo. Thank you so much. All right, hi everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation. Hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so my name is Kimberly Miller. I'm an environmental specialist uh, with the Morongo Band of Mission Indians working in their environmental protection department. And I'm gonna give you an overview of our program, hopefully tying into some of the things that were just discussed and how the tribe manages their water resources. So for some background, um, the reservation of the Morongo Band of Mission Indians is located in Southern California. We're in between the San Bernardino and San Jacinto Mountains, and it's definitely an area of transition. Um, we're approximately 35,000 acres, and it definitely ranges from low desert elevations to upwards uh, close to 6,000 feet uh, mountainous um, environments. So we have many different microclimates and different plant communities, and the water bodies on the reservation are primarily intermittent and ephemeral streams. And even though we don't have a lot of obvious um, perennial water resources, it's still very vital and makes um, living in the area possible. Um, and so management of water resources are very important to the tribe. The Morongo Environmental Protection Department has a full uh, time staff members. There's six of us. And we oversee a water program, air program, and pollution prevention program. So when I speak about the water program, I am speaking about um, surface water on the reservation, um, environmental water resources, so not drinking water that's handled separately. Our department is 70% funded through the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, this is grants through regulatory programs. Um, the water program is funded by grants under the Clean Water Act. And then also, um, our objectives are to protect Morongo's air, water, and land. And also, since we get funding from the EPA, we work to fulfill EPA strategic plan as well. On the right-hand um, portion of this slide, you can see our vision and mission statements. And one thing I want to point out is that both of them mention um, community involvement and collaboration, because as a department, we cannot do anything. Um, but as a community with Morongo tribal members and residents, that's how we envision um, protecting and preserving natural resources. So a little bit of background on Morongo's tribal water program. Um, the tribe received eligibility to implement uh, Clean Water Act Section 106, which is um, Surface Water Protection Program in 1993. And this acknowledged that uh, water resource protection is very important and takes a lot of work. So, they applied, um, the tribe applied for funding from EPA for that in 1993. And that actually predated the official um, creation of our Environmental Protection Department, which occurred in uh, 2000. So we currently um, receive funding from 
two programs under the Clean Water Act, Section 106, the Surface Water Protection, and then 319, which is non-point source pollution management. And we use these to protect water resources on the reservation in a variety of ways. Um, our big focuses are on monitoring water quality and then also outreach and education. And currently the approach for our program is to um, have tribal regulatory actions and then also non-regulatory activities to protect water quality. This includes compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act, um, surface water protection ordinance that the tribe uh, passed, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and then also non-point source pollution prevention. So things like recommending BMPs, uh, best management practices for projects, reaching out to the community, trying to get people to think about pollution prevention rather than just focusing on cleaning up uh, pollution after it occurs. So as I said, the program was founded in 1993. And with that, it started with water quality assessments, um, planning and studies. And these were a lot of plans focused on watershed protection, general water quality, um, drinking water source protection, and they were written by a lot of outside contractors. And while this provided really important information and a great basis for starting a water monitoring program and water management program, now we have focused and moved to updating plans and providing useful information with in-house expertise. So we take these plans um, and they were written as one-offs of outsider information with the data co they collected and we're working towards make, making them living documents. So we wanna have um, information that's useful to the community. Annually, we produce a water quality assessment report that summarizes the information that comes from our water monitoring program. And we also have a non-point source report and management plan that we update every five years. And it helps provide a good overview of potential threats to water quality on the reservation, and then plans out the activities we hope to address those for the next five years. So those are both two really important living documents that we provide to the community and use to guide our program. Another priority of our program is um, to prioritize important water bodies. And so this um, includes managing water resources that the tribe cares about. So on the right hand side, there's a picture of a wetland on the reservation and it's really unique and it has a lot of recreational value there's value for cultural um, importance, such as gathering basket weaving materials. And then also it's very important to wildlife. So we, as the Morongo Environmental Department can prioritize that because it's important to the tribe. And we also wanna monitor emerging concerns. And so this includes um, taking into consideration of what residents and tribal members notice and what they care about and being able to adapt quickly to those concerns. Um, climate change is a big one that is emerging and we try to stay on top of because the Morongo tribe, this is their land and they are tied to it much more than um, people living just in a general city. So we wanna make sure we're addressing tribal concerns. Um, so our surface water monitoring program has a few different types of uh, monitoring activities. We surface water monitor quarterly um, and get field results right automatically. And then we do a laboratory analysis twice a year for expanded parameters such as metals, nutrients, and bacteria. And then once a year, we do benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring. So we can kind of draw interpretations from the life cycle of the organisms living in the stream. Um, and this helps inform our chemical analysis. And our monitoring objective is to assess baseline water quality identify trends, and then also identify any potential or existing contaminant sources. Um, so here are a few of our different monitoring sites. And even though driving past the reservation, you don't necessarily think there is much water out there. We have a variety of water body types, including retention ponds, streams, wetlands, um, irrigation infrastructure, and waterfalls. So as I mentioned, we uh, manage our program with a tribally uh, regulatory approach currently. And so how we do this is we identify what the tribe's goals and objectives are. 
And then we also reference what nearby standards are. So the state has standards and water quality objectives. And we reference those having similarly situated waters, but we wanna tailor these to tribal needs. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of the, over the past few years of state water boards incorporating tribal beneficial uses and uh, subsistence fishing uses, things of that nature. But when you adopt tribal water protections and regulations, you are um, able to adjust those and automatically incorporate those. So in 2018, we created the Morongo Surface Water Protection Ordinance. And this was formally adopted through our tribal council and membership. And we were able to set specific objectives for tribal waters and also have an internal enforcement process. Now, the reason we took the tribal water quality um, regulatory approach is because currently, water quality standards that are enforceable under the Clean Water Act are only um, subject to waters of the state and for tribes that have either treatment as a state and um, or the federal government has jurisdiction. So this leaves a gap for water quality protection in um, a lot of tribal reservations and Morongo is actually moving towards EPA approved water quality standards. As mentioned, um, treatment as a state allows um, EPA to approve water quality standards and then they become enforceable under the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. So 77 tribes have treatment as a state for water quality standards and EPA has approved uh, 46 of these water quality standards. Morongo began the process in 2009. It was a very long drawn out process, but it was finally approved in April of 2018 and the process has gotten easier. And we expect to submit water quality standards for approval to EPA um, in the next few months. And so what this will mean is that um, any permits will have to incorporate our water quality standards. And another big portion of asserting tribal sovereignty and governance is section 401 of the Clean Water Act, which um, grants tribes and states with TAS the ability to comment on a federal permit and say that it does, um, if it discharges onto the reservation, it does um, protect the water quality standards. And if it doesn't, the tribe can put conditions on that permit, or if they think that no matter what conditions exist, it will not be protective of water quality, the tribe can actually deny certification of that federal permit. So it's a very big step in becoming not only a stakeholder in water quality um, management, but actually a co-regulator with EPA. So in addition to collaborating with EPA and working on uh, water quality standards regulations, we really try to focus on cooperation and collaboration, collaboration with other agencies. Um, as a tribe, our environmental department is very small compared to state and local agencies and I am the primary staff member of the water quality program. And so because of this, it's really important to look for opportunities to be involved in broader projects that can protect tribal waters or the watershed. And also um, to foster those collaborations, to have relationships with potential regulators surrounding you. So who might need to be worked with in the future and what kind of, um, regulations do they have? And so as Dina mentioned, it's really important to stay informed to insert yourself in with these agencies, state agencies, um, other landowners, local agencies. Um, and I always try to attend meetings and take training opportunities, even though they're not directly um, targeted towards tribes, it's always good to have the information to be able to keep on top and in line with um, the other water management um, op options and activities that are going on around you. And so finally, um, wrapping things up, another big portion in addition to monitoring for our program is outreach. We really focus on education and outreach to the tribal community. Annually, we have an Earth Day event where we invite um, local entities to have booths with information, games, activities. And we really want the tribal community to get involved to be able to know who we are. Um, and that way also, just like we try to do with other agencies, if they have environmental concerns, they are able to come with us and have those relationships to know what we're doing. Um, we also conduct outreach to not only um, 
other tribal events thrown on Morongo, but also to other tribes like their Earth Day events uh, to participate and encourage that collaboration. We have an intern program um, annually. We usually provide high school intern spots to um, tribal members from Morongo. And then also occasionally we have college interns. We provide education to the schools and we also have a social media newsletter and a website to reach out. And with that, um, I included my email here if you'd like to reach out and follow up questions. This was a very brief overview. I've also included our environmental department social media. A lot of the information is specifically for the Morongo community. However, there are good general tips and um, environmental information included as well. With that, Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kimberly. We appreciate um, you sharing that. And we will circle back here shortly after Christian um, shares uh, his presentation for some more um, question and answer. Go ahead, Christian, thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Alfred. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Christian Aceves. I am the environmental director here at Sabobo Band de Luceno Indians. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say a special thank you to my alma mater, CSUSB, for hosting this event and all the organizations that are participating, as well as the tribal nations. Thank you very much for your time and your efforts. So just to jump into it, uh, I wanted to give a brief geographical background of the Saboba Reservation. Uh, Saboba is located in the foothills of the San Jacinto Mountains. We are approximately 7,800 acres of rolling hills, deep ravines, and developed commercial and residential areas. Elevations here range from approximately 1,600 to 2,600 feet. Vegetation varies, uh, such as chaparral, annual grasses, and riparian areas. The average temperature here in San Jacinto can be 65 to 70 degrees with a whopping 100 degrees in the summer months. We receive an annual precipitation of about 12.45 inches per year. Uh, so looking into our water resources that we have here on the Saboba Reservation, the three main water channels I'd like to discuss today is the San Jacinto River, Poppy Creek, and Indian Creek. The San Jacinto River uh, flows along the southwest boundary of the reservation. The San Jacinto River is um, sourced by Lake Hemet, which is dammed at the moment. So this results in this, the river flowing intermittently and is usually dry most of the year. However, large storm events typically seen in the winter months can trigger flash flooding and high seasonal flows. Here, it creates a uh, alluvial fan for the portion of the, of the reservation nearest to the river. So you could see how it enters and exits the reservation respectfully. Poppy Creek is the next water channel I'd like to discuss. It has about two miles of uh, range within the reservation. It is also intermittent and flowing only during precipitation events that are also usually in the winter months. When it flows, it does join the San Jacinto River in the southeast region of the reservation, here where it conjuncts. Um, the next water channel would be the Indian Creek, which is approximately four miles of stream and creek located in the reservation. The interesting thing about this creek is that it is perennial and it's sourced by a hot spring. So this uh, primary hot spring is caused by deep, deep geothermal activity that heats up the spring throughout the year. This spring has been a key area for previous cultural and recreational activities for Saboba. So here again is the Indian Creek. We have the Saboba Hot Spring here. We've established three monitoring points with our program, one being right on top of the hot spring, and it provides very crucial information and data. The next being right under there at the first uh, crossing. We have a lot of activity there in that, oh, my apologies. We have a lot of activity there in that monitoring location, a lot of um, community engagement in recreational activities and cultural practices as well, which is why we've established our two main monitoring stations there. We also have our third monitoring station here along Poppet Creek, where you get some nice drainage areas during the winter months when monitoring is um, allowed. We do aim to grow the program to establish more monitoring locations at the conjunctions of each creek and stream. So when the creek meets the San Jacinto River and when the Indian Creek meets the San Jacinto River, we do aim to establish more monitoring locations 
when weather conditions permit. On the northern uh, side of the reservation, we do have a good amount of springs, although these springs do not produce surface water unless it is in the winter months when the water table rises. We also have some springs on the eastern boundary of the reservation, which act similarly to the northern ones that they do not produce source um, surface water only in the winter months when we do have uh, higher water tables. So that's just a brief overview, overview of the water resources here on the reservation. So uh, one of the main programs we have here is the Clean Water Act 106, which my peers here discussed uh, Previously, so just to give a brief background, the Clean Water Act is the foundation that protects the surface water quality in the United States. Primarily, Section 106 is what authorizes the EPA to provide financial assistance to states, eligible agencies, and in our case, eligible tribes. So essentially, the EPA provides financial assistance in the form of water pollution control. Uh, our main objective for Saboba's water quality monitoring program is to continuously assess the quality of surface water within the Saboba reservation using quantitative methods. Data collected from monitoring is used to characterize water quality and establish a baseline for reservation surface waters that will aid in the detection of any possible changes that may have negative impact to environmental and human health. Monitoring data also serves to help the tribe to establish water quality standards, regulations, and implement future ordinances. Ongoing monitoring is required for the long-term characterization of surface water quality and is very necessary to you know, surmise irregularities in water quality baseline standards. And this allows the Saboba Tribal Environmental Department to make proper decisions to address these changes. So uh, not only does long-term water quality allow us to characterize our waters, identify emerging problems, but it also allows us to identify trends over time, uh, determine whether pollution control programs are effective or not, aid in directing pollution control methods in sensitive areas and responding to emergencies such as spills and as our, in our case, flash flooding events. So here we have uh, a little screenshot of our environmental specialist doing some monitoring in action. We use a MPT-20 flow cell probe that can monitor every parameter at once. The sensor is placed at a water surface uh, depth of no more than six inches. At this level, it only takes a few seconds for the flow to, or for the monitor to read all parameters and record them in real time. We, our monthly parameter measurement data will be the primary source of data to observe water quality data. So we do, since we are um, blessed with having a perennial water source on the reservation, we do conduct quarterly monitoring and we are trying to expand that to more consistent monitoring, but as of now, we only do quarterly. The parameters here is what we often uh, test for and they may be similar to a lot of other 106 programs uh, that we have temperature, pH, DO, specific conductance, turbidity. And then a little different is we have, we also test for oxidation reduction potential. So ORP measures the ability of a lake, river, or in our case, stream and creek to cleanse itself and break down the waste products, such as contaminants of dead plants and animals. When ORP value is high, there's a lot of oxygen present in the water. This means that bacteria that decomposes that tissue and contaminants can work more efficiently. So in general, uh, the higher the ORP value, the healthier our water body is. Uh, we also do biannual uh, sampling of these analytics here, or analytes here. We have major ions and then dissolved metals. Again, we are looking to expand our monitoring program so that we can sample potentially quarterly and then test for bacterial uh, items such as E. coli and total coliform. We understand those are often found in surface waters, especially if there's livestock or agriculture or just uh, community engagement. So those are definitely um, some aspects we're looking to expand the department and just grow in those monitoring uh, regards. So moving forward to another program that Suboba has is the Clean Water Act 319. Uh, and the 319 is a really good program. Uh, if awarded, the EPA provides similar financial and technical assistance to support activities that manage non-point source pollution and other environmental threats. Um, 
activities under the Clean Water Act 319 usually include non-point source training for staff or tribal members, watershed planning, which is what we were talking about earlier, you know, getting involved with your local watershed agencies, riparian planting to um, support stream bank health and promote community engagement, livestock exclu exclusion fencing. Often we find um, livestock roaming the reservation and that's what leads to uh, essentially additional um, nutrients being loaded into the streams. Restoration activities for our springs and other items, non-point source ordinance development that we are implementing now, and then of course, outreach and education, which is one of the most important in uh, my opinions. So uh, as mentioned earlier and with other environmental programs, community, community involvement is crucial in this program and many others. Currently, we partner with Zaboba's Noli Education Facility to help integrate both the Clean Water Act 106 and 319 into their coursework. By doing so, students become educated on real-time issues their reservation faces. So for example, once a quarter, the environmental department leads an interactive activity that implements what students have learned in the classroom. Here we have um, this activity that we occurred last quarter where we took out uh, eighth graders out into the Indian Creek and we were doing a bioanalysis of microinvertebrates and as well as other animal, other vertebrates looking for frogs, for speckled days, and just understanding the, the beauty that water resources provides to the reservation, both culturally and um, spiritually. And then lastly, one of the bigger events that we host uh, revolving around the 319 is a Tree of Life event that is yearly. This brings together tribal community as we plant native species in riparian areas. By doing so, we are improving stream health and implementing erosion and control methods. One of the main issues Saboba faces uh, with flash flooding events is erosion uh, destruction of our stream banks. So we aim to plant cultural native species that can help compact the soil better and minimize erosion controls. And by implementing uh, these types of activities along with other educational events such as our Earth Day and, and similar events, we are able to have the community members buy into these programs. And by them buying into these programs, they continue to understand the importance of them and then want to engage more and continue up the good habits and the practices that we as a tribal environmental department are um, trying to represent. And uh, with just with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and thank you everyone for participating and listening and engaging and being very attentive. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. And um... Just a full disclosure, poor Christian has gone out to uh, <laughs> many of our, he was on my water uh, quality team. So it's just so wonderful to see him bridge this um, into a, a tribal community. So um, yeah, having a proud moment there, but um, <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, open up the, the floor here um, to questions from our uh, keynote speaker um, and our panelists as well. Um, and in, in the process of, of waiting for some questions to start coming in, so you can use the uh, Q&A um, or, or the chat. Um, I, I'm really kind of curious um, what you see and, and you know, you're, you're to, to, to everyone right here, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're trying to engage with different types of agencies, um, but you're also trying to get them to understand um, the process of engagement, right? Because it's, it's definitely different uh, with tribal and indigenous communities. So um, if, if you're just a student or a faculty member or staff, or, you know, someone coming from a university um, place and you're wanting to reach out and, and work with your, your communities, um, what are some suggestions that you would have um, just to ensure that, you know, there is a, a standard of respect and, and understanding, but, um, but what are some of the suggestions that you all would have for, for those of us that are really interested in engaging more with your communities? And it's open to uh, uh, Dina, Christian, or, or, or Kimberly. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. Um, I think when it comes to outside um, people, students, academics, 
it's definitely helpful to have an idea of what you envision the working relationship to look like and what benefits there are towards the tribe and also have a plan about data management and respect for privacy. Um, a lot of times I know in the academic world, it's like, we'd love to come do the study, collect this data, and then we'll share it to everybody and it'll be great. But there needs to be acknowledgement that there are sensitivities, cultural resources, concerns about data ownership and sovereignty that need to be addressed beforehand. So I definitely think it's a good thing for people to consider those items before they approach tribes. Um, we've done lots of projects with different entities in the past, but it's, sometimes it's hard to have to work people through that each and every time. For you, it might be a one-time project once every couple of years, but for us, it's a continual balancing of those agencies and concerns. Um, so that's what I would say. Yeah, I agree with Kimberly. Uh, definitely working with Native American tribes, there is that sense of sensitivity revolving around cultural aspects and sharing data or sharing some sensitive information. So definitely understanding that you are coming on to a new sovereign nation and it's different than working with other organizations that all fall under that uh, federal umbrella. So I would, I would say just have that in mind when you come working with tribes and have a more open-mindedness when it comes to engaging in these projects and understanding that they're more passionate when it comes to natural resources because this is their land and this is not somewhere where they can just uproot and move somewhere else to a different town. This is their nation and their land that they're going to be here for generations to come. So just to have that sort of respect and that understanding that this is not just a piece of land to them, it is much more than that. I would also add that, um, that anytime you go into a tribal community, you come with a set of assumptions, um, a, uh, a conditioning, a social conditioning that you might not even be aware that you have, um, such, such as, uh, an entitlement to information. Like, so don't go into a community believing that, that you have a right to, um, to gather data from tribal communities or anybody, uh, but especially tribal communities. And so, um, so check your privilege at the door, I would say. <laughs> That's fantastic advice. <laughs> um, there is a question um, from Susie Earp. And it reads, is domestic water served by a local agency or is domestic water well water um, on tribal land? And if an agency serves domestic water, how are the relationships between the tribe and the agency? Uh, I can talk on that subject. So uh, Saboba, uh, Band of Lusenio Indians, their primary drinking water is allocated from their groundwater. So in 2008, they did win a settlement with the state and the local agency here that they cannot, their aquifers cannot drop below 9,000 gallons. So while we do share our aquifers with the municipal district here in San Jacinto, if our water table ever drops below a certain threshold, those outside agencies have to stop their, um, their pumping of our aquifer, our water and they have to go outsource their water somewhere else because we have the water rights to those uh, this groundwater and they have to stay at a certain level so that's how we kind of work with the municipal districts here we have a good understanding and a good partnership when it comes to that so that's just something how, how we work with and how we deal with is just making sure you have established water rights and um, a certain threshold so that your community members are never in in danger and threat of of no water, especially in these times of droughts. In Morongo, we have a water department that serves our community. So we have groundwater, but uh, Morongo manages its own wells and runs the drinking water system. So it's not an outside agency. Wonderful. Um, and I have an, another question <laughs> coming from my curiosity. Um, it, as you look into the future, uh, we, we 
clearly are in a very prolonged drought situation. And, um, you know, we're, we're getting maybe this year three major rain events, depending on where you're located. I'm curious how um, maybe your uh, approach to this topic of water resources may be shifting. Um, and internally, um, you know, with councils and stuff like that, where do these, these conversations emerge from? You know, uh, does it really kind of come from a, a department that's informing the council? Is it is it coming downwards? And I'm just kind of curious how, you know, these kind of concerns um, emerge within your communities and um, how you uh, prioritize, obviously, um, the perceptions um, that your communities have in trying to address these really complex um, issues. Well, one of the one of the issues we face due to climate change is um, drier weather in the summer months and harder precipitation events in the winter, which causes a lot of erosion and stormwater runoff. So um, I work with the Public Works Department and other similar departments that we kind of formulate uh, a climate change mitigation plan or adaptation plan to show how we can adapt to these uh, issues, and then from there. We present them to our tribal executive officer, who he then delegates that to the tribal council. So often it's kind of a game of working with another department to develop a plan, develop a uh, adaptation plan, and then allocate that plan to our tribal administrator or tribal executive officer. And from there, they take that action item to the council and the council then deliberates amongst themselves. How important is this? What do we need to do? where can we get the funding, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes back down the line, uh, the chain of command to us. And then our tribal executive officer delegates the tasks that the council would like to see based off the plans that we have. And I think um, here at Morongo, we definitely mirror some of what I noticed the new cycle does in the state of California. When it's raining and there's available water, People are happy, people are fine, it's a low priority. Um, so in that sense, sometimes drought does help to um, bring these items to the forefront. I know um, in the last drought, well, depending on how you wanna separate droughts, in um, the drought around 2012 to 2015, 16, um, we had a lot of tree die off in some of our riparian areas that was very noticeable to tribal members who recreate and spend time up in our canyons. And so that definitely brought concern to the forefront. So it can come from the community, from tribal council. Um, definitely though, with the drought, there's noticeable effects and then that drives outward projects um, in years of good rain, and those kind of things, sometimes our department does have to remind people that we still need to be protecting our water resources, um, even though they seem plentiful at the moment. Yes, go ahead, Adina. I wanted to ask a question of our two tribal um, folks if you can talk about the relationship between water and the problem with the oaks um, and uh, the, 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 the uh, what do they call the, the golden oak boring beetle or something like that? It... Uh, yeah, so uh, fortunately for us, we don't have uh, invasive species issues with the golden beetle. Or is that the invasive pest that you're referring to? Yeah. 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 We don't have an issue with that at the moment. We do have a array of coast live oaks throughout the reservation, but we're fortunate enough to not have that uh, invasive pest as an issue. We do have pest management plans implemented. So if we ever do uh, come across that, we are ready. Currently, we are tag we have uh, environmental specialists and our GIS specialists doing um, an oak tagging uh, project right now where they go out throughout the whole um, 7,000 acres of the reservation and tag physically by hand the oaks. So they mark the oak with the tag and then they, they upload it into a GIS software that spews out a map. That way we can um, record our cultural resources. And then if we do have any um, beetle or pest issues, we can go ahead and say, okay, tree number 
81 through 63 is having issues with pest management. So let's go ahead and ad address our pest management plan and see how we can how we can address the situation. So uh, that's that's what we're facing now. But we don't have any um, issues when it comes to oaks not getting enough water resources. As I said, we do have a, a plentiful amount of groundwater and aquifers that I'm sure they're able to pull from. One issue we do have, though, is oaks being in riparian areas. And as erosion erodes the stream banks and coupled with high winds, these oaks fall over and mess up the roads and, and cause the stream banks to, to kind of get a lot of debris in there. So that's an issue we're facing as a tribe is these oaks have for a long time held this soil intact, but with changing climate and these conditions occurring, they are beginning to erode and, and capsize and fall over. So mm. that's something we're trying to implement now into our new management of uh, our coast live oaks. Yeah, and I think in terms for us, oaks are very important trees. They're very visually um, identifiable trees. A lot of tribal members, you know, if you told them to go find uh, an alder, they might not be able to do it. But if you tell them to find an oak, they can probably do it. So um, we uh, do some forest management when time and funding allows. And we have definitely noticed that drought compounds um, stress on the trees and definitely makes them more vulnerable. Uh, we also don't have any gold spotted oak borer currently on the reservation. However, it is now in the San Bernardino mountains it's definitely spreading. So we try to bring awareness because there is concern and there is cultural value to the oaks, but there has definitely been um, compounding of stressors on trees that we wanna watch out for and try to have a holistic management plan towards. Wonderful. Um, well, not climate change is not wonderful, but <laughs> I appreciate your approach. Um, uh, Dina, I have a, a specific question for you. Um, you know, we, we've seen over uh, the past uh, couple years um, more uh, leadership or, or tribal and indigenous uh, representation and leadership related to public lands. And I'm particularly thinking of things like the National Forest. Um, however, um, a lot of our public lands have a very conflicting history, <laughs> clearly, um, you know, with, with these communities. And so, I am curious your thoughts on if you feel that we're starting to see a turning point into which, um, and, and maybe there's local examples um, or, or, or other you know, um, areas we could be thinking about, but where you're starting to see um, just a shift in these uh, perceptions of elevating more tribal and indigenous perspectives in these landscapes and really bringing um, you know, the vision of, of, of the realities of, of, of that transition. Um, and I'm just kind of curious what you're kind of seeing from, you know, um, the work that you're in and if that is a uh, misconception <laughs> that, that there's, there's a shift uh, happening um, or um, if there's not a shift uh, where we tend to be stuck in this recognition in public lands. Um, I do see there's a definite shift happening and it probably you know, ranges from region to region, but, um, you know, there's, it's visible in some of the documents in some, the agencies like the National Park Service um, and some of the personnel that they hire and the programs that they have, some of the tribal um, education programs. And, and, and they even have, you know, people that are like tribal liaisons. Um, I became aware of, so I work in this, I work in a project called the Upstander Project, and the Upstander Project is based in Boston, and they do education for K through, like, uh, professional development for K through 12 teachers, and, um, but also increasingly uh, museum directors and, um, and park service personnel, so we had, like, a uh, so the, the, the goal, the Upstander Project does the six day uh, academy every summer. And so I work with them every summer. And the, the program is about bringing, uh, teaching, teaching genocide um, and how 
that how teachers can uh, bring genocide studies into their K through 12 classrooms, especially around American Indian American history. And so uh, like when we had one year, a couple of years ago, we had uh, quite a few National Park Service personnel and one of them was the Northeastern Tribal Liaison. And so um, we have since in the Upstander Project developed a really strong relationship with them. And um, they, I, I personally am not working with them, but my colleagues in the program are um, working with them and doing some, what I think is some pretty deep education with, the, with these folks in that region of the National Park Service, which I think is going to be um, much more national in scope. Um, so, so it's definitely happening. Um, the, there's a document too that the National Park Service developed um, it's pretty new in the last couple of years, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's about, uh, it, it's uh, a, like an iterate or a, a detailing of National Park Service's partnerships uh, in terms of co-management and collaborative um, land management with tribes. So, uh, you know, these are, I think these are good indications that things are changing. It's never really enough, in my opinion. Um, and it always has to go further. Um, and, you know, I think this is just part of the, the generational work that, that this is how I see it. Like how we, if we are to think about it as decolonizing work, decolonizing the relationships between uh, tribes and, and governments, um, it's something that is always ongoing. And I don't, I think it's more of a journey than a destination. Like, I don't know that you can really fully decolonize uh, in a settler colonial system like the US, but it can be held up as a goal and ideal. Um, so that that's, that's my sense of it. I, so, you know, what, what's, little I know about it, that's, uh, that's kind of what it looks like to me is that there are attempts being made. And um, even in the, <clears throat> even in the EPA, I mean, interestingly, <clears throat> the, uh, so I'm working on one of the projects I'm working on right now also is an EPA uh, project with Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians. And it was a grant that came, it was an environmental justice grant that came out of the EPA, but the grant is for disaster management and resilience, tribal, or, well, not just tribal, but community disaster uh, and management and resilience. And, um, and what usually those kinds of grants come out of the, the out of FEMA, but this one was unusual because it has this environmental justice uh, focus on it and it came out of the EPA. And um, that came out of the Trump administration EPA, which I found interesting. And, uh, and, and another thing that happened was um, the return of like 40,000 acres of land that happened under the Trump administration. Now, I'm not saying that the Trump administration is all that and they did all kind of good things, but these are the kinds of things that happen sometimes under the radar without people really noticing. Um, and that I think is, is, indicates institutional shift and change. So... And you know, I I I just find that interesting. Thank you. And and we have a question um, from a graduate student at CHUSB, Rama. Um, she writes, "I have always wondered if the Native American community is really interested in involvement with the federal government programs and plans. <laughs> How interested is the new generation to both?" hold on to their tribal treasure and to go to college and to be in higher leadership and in federal positions. Hey Rama, that was an excellent question. So the environmental department here, while we focus to um, serve every community member, we specifically aim and target at the elders because they have a lot of uh, respect from tribal members and they listen to them. 
as well as the youth of the community because they are going to be the, the next generations who are going to be involved with the federal government and all these programs and plans so much like other environmental departments we do have internship programs uh, which we allow the youth to come and work with the department as well as we partner with NOLI um, Education Foundation here where we try to integrate a lot of the environmental programs into their coursework and then we take them out to the field and it's kind of like a living lab where they are able to implement the work that they learned in the classroom and implement it into the field. We also do try to promote uh, further education such as college or other graduate programs. So it's definitely something that we have a key emphasis on and we try to implement that in the youth now. Thank you for your question. I would say that, you know, I, those NOLI students end up in very, you know, frequently in our program at Cal State San Marcos um, in our Native, in American Indian Studies uh, program where we have a major. And, uh, and so, and we have at Cal State San Marcos, the highest percentage of Native American students um, of any school in the state. So, um, and, and we are growing, our program is growing like exponentially. It, we're in a major growth spurt right now, especially uh, with um, AB 1460, which is the ethnic studies bill, um, which requires the teaching of ethnic, the, the taking of ethnic studies um, to get a degree in the Cal State system and um, community college system. So um, one of the ways that we're growing uh, it is we're developing concentrations for our major and one of the concentrations will be in environmental um, stewardship and uh, TEK uh, and those kinds of issues. So, um, so there's, there's uh, you know, we definitely see it on our campus, um, the, the interest in this. And some of those people will go on, the students will go on to work for their tribes or they'll go on to work in government agencies um, and what have you. But, uh, but yes, the, the, the trend is definitely there and um, higher education is super important to tribal communities. And Kimberly, um, Morongo also has a, a youth environmental um, program as well, if I recall. So we have um, a school on the reservation that goes uh, preschool through um, eighth grade. And we work very closely with those um, students. Annually, we go into their classrooms and we also involve them greatly with Earth Day. And then we also have a high school internship program usually. And we take two high school students that don't even have to live on the reservation. They're either tribal uh, members or descendants from Morongo, and they get to shadow our departments and learn from us. And our department is made up of individuals who some have degrees, and then there are a few that do not. And so they're able to see the options um, that they could pursue an environmental career with the tribe if they so choose. And also we do try to encourage um, them to go on and further their education to be able to take on um, additional positions, outside positions um, with their tribe and in incorporate the tribal uh, knowledge and priorities and concerns into the other work. Um, so we do work with the youth quite a bit. Absolutely fantastic, thank you. Um, I know even from my experience, the more you touch and the younger you get out there, the more you, you start to embrace that in your life. So it's just wonderful to, to have those opportunities. So I'm gonna look for one more question. Okay, I, I think um, those are the questions that we have. Um, I wanted to see um, if there's anything else that the three of you wanted to share. And of course, thank you so tremendously much for your time and, and expertise and, and your willingness to be with, here with us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you everyone for your attentiveness and your time. It was very, very great to engage with you all. And um, Saboba Band of San Indians is hosting their annual Earth Day, April 28th. Anyone is more than welcome to attend. It is open to the public and to other organizations and tribal members. So please feel free to attend. There will be food. <laughs> I always get students there. <laughs> 
Yes, please share that with us, um, Christian. And we, we would, any upcoming events or anything that you guys are involved in, um, we would absolutely love to um, get that information channeled out uh, to our community here at, at Cal State San Bernardino and of course our Palm Desert campus as well. Definitely, we'll be more than happy to share with you that information, Dr. Alford. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank all of you again um, uh, on behalf of, of CSUSB. This is um, what we hope is one of many, many opportunities that we want to expand um, to bring these you know, really important perspectives and, and into our community and to really um, start you know, threading that into the work that we do. Um, and so I, I hope to um, continue our conversations <laughs> um, in the future and just appreciate uh, everyone for coming uh, to attend today. And so uh, with that, and you're getting a lot of praise on the chat, so <laughs> please visit that. Um, so with that, I, I would like to um, thank everyone again and, and release you back uh, to hopefully not another Zoom, um, but um, hopefully you can enjoy uh, some of the warmer weather that we're having here um, and, and March 1st, <laughs> very hot weather, which is concerning, but that's okay. Um, and Christian has uh, shared his uh, email here. Um, and if you would like to connect with our presenters, um, please reach out to me. Um, you can find me um, uh, through the uh, CSUSB Geography and Environmental Studies faculty page. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and we appreciate your time and participation, um, and we look forward to finding more avenues to continue these types of conversations. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation and for all your hard work putting this together, Jennifer. Thank you again for your participation. And, and I appreciate amazing. the tribal perspectives, Kim and Chris, Chris. Thank you so much. That was a wealth of information. Likewise, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Go Yodis. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.